Hello again. Tonight we are here again in the presence of the Lord. Not because we are under duress, but because we cherish to be where the Lord is. Because where the Lord is, we have strength against weakness. So here we are, expecting to be edified by the word of the Lord. The word comes to strengthen us and to let us overcome all our weaknesses. So I trust that as you listen to me, the Lord will bless you greatly and lift your spirit high above anything that is letting you down. God richly bless you. Shall we pray? Eternal God, we want to thank you for the great privilege we always have as children, born of the Spirit, called by the name of the Lord. Your word declared to God that you are with us always, in every circumstance, we have always seen the revelation of your hand, a proof that we are not alone in our walk. Even though there are struggles, we still have hope because we have the faintest idea that we may not see you, but we know you are working for us and with us in every way. So we pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you will bless us. You will bless, O oh God, uh, the word and bring edification of God to all those who seek to listen to you. I give thanks and praise to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, Thursday, we started um, we started having uh, some insight in the scriptures, which I called uh, the Believer's Gem, because it's so relevant to our present walk. To see the glorious life Christ has given to us, the glorious ministry Christ has given to us, as against what can fight us, what can, can make us lose hope, that we've been told that we've been called into a glorious liberty, which each and every one of us have to maintain in spite of everything. So we want to continue where I stopped last Thursday. And last Thursday, we started from the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and then verse 16. So here we are. I want to read the main scripture. Then we'll continue from where I stopped. But God's word says that, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but I have denounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Nor walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commanding ourselves to every man, every man's conscience in the sight of God. So verse 16 says, verse 16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So we have found out one or two important ways of maintaining our stability and our faith in God in spite of everything. So last week, we looked at the following point. The signs that the signs that shows that we are losing heart. And we said that lack of prayerlessness is one of the signs. And it is easy that we can lose heart when we do not pray. Because we said prayer gives us a spiritual capacity 
to hold against every odd. Now we also look at uh, uh, growing weary in doing good. The believer need not get tired in doing good. At the moment, your hand is getting weaker from doing good. It's all a sign that you are losing heart. We found out that people can take advantage of you for the good you do. And, and being, being, being taken advantage of can lead you to be discouraged. So we also find out that, um, we also find out the following point, We say some reasons also that can lead us to lose heart is tribulation, tribulations, tribulations. Every believer faces tribulation. Every believer faces hard time, whether internally or externally, we face hard time. Hard time from families, hard time from friends, hard time from persecutors, and hard times when the spirit of darkness ganked up against you because you are the one who is in the front line. You are the one who is disciplined in righteousness. You are the one who is exercising faith. You are the one who says that you are holding claim to God and His Word, that the Word never fails. So the enemy will gunk up against you and bring you trouble. But in spite of all these things, the Word of God gives us a blessed hope, a way out of all these troubles that come on us. That is why we can't lose hope, we can't faint, we can't be discouraged because, because God is on our side. The Holy Spirit is on our side. We also found out that lawlessness Lawlessness, where lawlessness abound, the heart of many grow cold. We find lawlessness in the church, which is what I call gross indiscipline in the church. We found lawlessness in the world. And lawlessness comes with some ferocity, some power, as if it is the truth. At least if you do not align with the lie, then you are not in a modern world. So all these things come to discourage us. But we've been encouraged that holding, holding claim to what is true, holding claim to the word of God, holding claim to the testimony of God brings us victory. Why? Because we know the goal in front of us. We know we've been promised eternal life. We know that we cannot uh, uh, put our hope on the platter of failure while we group, uh, we, we, we go against or we go for things that does not help. We call them modern things. So uh, we look at that one also. But today, I want us to look at the concluding part of this teaching that I am bringing to you. And we want to begin uh, by looking at uh, the point here, the secret of not losing heart. There is a secret of not losing heart, which will take me back to our reference scripture. Our reference scripture says that because we have this ministry, we do not lose heart or we are not discouraged or we must not be discouraged. Now, and I said that ministry, which is work, work for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit have called each one of us into serving Him, serving the eternal God that we that, that have called us. And our ministry, it is not only to ourselves, our ministry is to the world. By example, we have to demonstrate godliness. We have to demonstrate the goodness of God. We want to demonstrate the strength of God. We want to demonstrate the hope of our calling to the world. So each and every one of us have a unique and a peculiar ministry. So by this, we hold on to the assignment the Lord has given to us to make sure that we fulfill the assignment. In comparison to the ministry of the Old Testament, the Bible describes the New Testament saints and our calling as being called to a glorious, glorious, glorious future. We've been called to glorious liberty. 
We've been called to faith that cannot be defeated. We've been called to hope that cannot be disappointed. And so let us look at some of the things that actually, that actually uh, uh, explain the ministry that we have. Every believer is assured of the power of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. What am I talking about? The crucifixion of Christ gave us liberty and brought us back to God. More also, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It is the empowerment of every believer and is the empowerment of every church. So every believer who is associated with Christ's crucifixion, which include his death and his resurrection, has been given a powerful calling, has been given a powerful calling, has been given a more promising hope. We've been given a more assuring faith. And this faith is what we cannot toy with. So you compare this, we are called into hope. Now, the, 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 the New Testament says also, have benefited from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Jesus promised us that he, it, is, it, it is expedient for him to go. And when he goes, he will send us another comforter. Expedient means was important for him to go. And if he goes, he will send us another comforter. And he says the comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in his name, the Holy Spirit will be our empowerment. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will become my witnesses in everywhere in the world. Now, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our guide. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is the joy of those who are sad. The Holy Spirit comforts us. The Holy Spirit is our leader. The Holy Spirit instructs us when it is necessary for us to have insight into certain divine truths. So, isn't our calling much glorious? Haven't we been given a ministry that we mustn't toy with? Much more, we have been given a victorious life on this earth. What do I mean by this? We've been given a victorious life on this earth. So we have victory through Christ who resurrected and defeated the enemy. So whether by engagement or by whatever struggles that you find yourself in, we've been assured by the word of God that the New Testament saints will not be defeated in their struggles. But the New Testament saying is bound to conquer because Christ our Lord has risen and given us the victory. And this is the victory that we live by. Our strength, the victory, our hope, the victory that overcome our struggle, the victory that gives us, that gives us an edge over everything that is coming against us. Because Christ in us is the hope of glory. Because he who is in you is greater than he that is, is in the world. So we've been promised also eternal life. Eternal life is the life without end. So not only are we given victory in life, but we also promise eternal life. Life without end. Life that has no end. So the believer is not going to die like a chicken, perish like a chicken. The believer is not going to die, remain in the grave. But the believer sees death as a transition. A necessary transition to enter into glory with God. So when we are saying that, we will meet by and by in the presence of God. We mean it. It's the believer's hope. Without this hope, then is our faith questioned. Without this hope, 
Then is our faith question. I repeat again. So Paul was right to say that because we have been given such a ministry, we do not lose hope. We do not lose hope. We do not lose hope even if the world come against us. We do not lose hope even if, if all things are coming against us. We do not lose hope. We stand strong. We stand strong in our faith. Now so, Paul's reference, which I want us to read again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, See, we have this ministry. As we have received what? Mercy, we faint not. It is only the New Testament church or the New Testament believer who lives on the mercy of God. He operates on the mercy of God. Where we do not merit or we do not deserve in a kindness from God, God show us mercy on the premise of the fact that Jesus died and paid the price for us. So, we have mercy. So, we have favor. So, we have the love of Christ that passes all knowledge. You can't compare this with the saints in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, their shortfalls are easily visited and punished. But in the New Testament, God, God have mercy with us. It does not mean that we have to entrench our weaknesses or, 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 or progress in our failings. But rather, it gives us the opportunity to please the God who shows mercy. Not to infuriate the God that shows mercy. This is the kindness of God. Praise the Lord. Well, we continue to share the word of God. God's word says in Haggai chapter 2 verse 9, it says that, he said, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than, than of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house. This can be understood in two ways. The glory of the latter house, number one, Referring to every believer as the dwelling place of God, the house of God, the temple of God. God has garnished his temple, made it much glorious because we are free from sin by virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. There's nothing to hinder God from having access to us. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says he dwells in us by his spirit. Hallelujah. So as I walk, I am walking as the house of God, as the dwelling place of God. Hallelujah. And therefore God is renewing us day by day, making us much more glorious, looking much more beautiful, much more presentable, and much more acceptable. Oh, hallelujah. Now this is what God has done for us. Now he says, because we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, we have much more an excellent calling. Because we have overcome death, we are having an excellent calling. Because we have victory over every circumstance on this earth, we have an excellent calling. Because we are promised life forever, we have an excellent calling. So what is expected of us is to bear forth in joy and strengthen the weak and preach the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. This is what the word of God is telling us. 
But let us look at the emphasis here I have just quoted. Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. It says, The glory of this latter house. So me, the latter house. Me, the present dwelling place of God. The glory of this house. Not the house that is made of what? That is made of what? Tell me. That is made of bricks and mortar. But you, the person listening to me. You, God found in you a dwelling place. And God want to garnish it to look so beautiful. God want to reveal his gloriousness through us. And he does it today. When great things are happening through the believer. When God is revealing his love through the believer. When the world is knowing God through the believer. He is making his house much more glorious. You know what? There are times I wonder how God works when I speak. How God works when I pray. How God works when I declare. How God works in my warfare against the enemy. All that I see is that I make myself available and I pray and I pray God out. I pray his word against the enemy. I stand resilient in faith. I stand in hope, not sidetracking my confidence. And lo and behold, God shows forth and great things happen. And people share the ministry, the testimony of their victory. When the chains fall off, it's awesome. It's awesome. Now let me tell you, church. It is not only limited to frontline ministers. You who is listening to me. God wants to make your life so pleasant so that great things will work through you. That is why he's saying that the end time house of God, the end time dwelling place of God, the dwelling place of God, the temple of God who, who is you, God wants to make it much more glorious in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, hallelujah. And he said, in this place, Will I give peace? See the Lord of hope. You see, in the face of turmoil, in the face of what strive, when the storm rages, the world does not understand how we are able to sail through it. We are not the ones who is questioning. We are not the ones who are murmuring. We are not the ones who are doubting. It's all a sign that in the face of all provocation, we still rest in God. We still rest in God and we see his work at, we see his hands at work. You see, in us, the peace of God dwells in us. He said, in the world you have tribulation. But in me, you have peace. In me, you have hope. So God will give us peace. A perfect peace. A perfect peace when it is so rough and so challenging, undescribable, that we don't know how to get out of it. He's going to give you peace because he made his house not to be defeated, but his house to be much more glorious than any other thing in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, tonight I'm so excited that I'm bringing you a living hope. I'm just so excited that this word will increase somebody's faith. It will increase somebody's confidence. We will stand so strong and never compromise. Never sell our birthright. Never align with the world system. Because that which is ahead of us is much more and is much better than what we are being offered today. In Jesus' mighty name. I want you to understand as we talk, we're, we're looking at the secret of not losing heart. Let me tell you, church, every believer stands to be tested. Listen, I'm not saying to be tempted, but I'm saying that every believer stands to be tested. You know, when we are so flowery and we are full of adulation, in a glorious praise to God, the Lord come to test us, 
to find out that in spite of all the beauty, the beauty, the pleasantries, the good things that are coming our way, can we still maintain the same testimony? Can we still say he is Lord? Can we say that he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end? Can we still maintain the testimony of the Lord? So the Lord will come to test us to find out what is our stability and to what extent can we hold against the storm. So you know what? In John chapter 6, verse 60 to 64, there is something to look at. Look at in verse 60, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can bear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Though this offend you, what? And if ye shall see the Son of Man, are sent up where he was where he was before. Verse 63, he said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, and the flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning. Who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. The last thing that should be found from a believer is to betray Jesus, is to betray Jesus. Sometime our our falling away, our backstepping from God, all of a sudden our testimony is changing. All of a sudden, we are murmuring. All of a sudden, we are the one complaining. All of a sudden, we are the one regretting. We are regretting for having made a decision, or we are regretting for having committed our life to the Lord, only because certain struggles have come our way. You see, so betraying God is one of the gravest and the crucial sin that the believers should not be found with. Here the scripture was telling us that Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring, were murmuring over his sayings. They were murmuring and complaining against anything that he says. Because they could not hold to what Christ is promising. You know, sometimes you read the word of God and you see certain scriptures lift up in your face. And then you sit down and wonder, can this be possible? Can this be, be possible? Yes, for as long as it's the word of God, Nothing is too hard for him to do. One time Jesus said, If you will not worship me, I have the power to raise up stones to worship me. So you know that God's word honors God and God cannot fail in whatever he says. So sometimes the sayings are very difficult for us to hold to. Let us not question it. You know, let us not question it. A working faith is what just accept the word of God and act upon that faith. Jesus said they were murmuring. And I will not be surprised that in our present age, there are many people who are culprits in what Christ is saying. We murmur against God, we complain against God. So the Bible said, let not that man think that he can receive anything of the Lord. When we become divided in our mind. The scripture says that when we become double-minded. 
Let not that man think that he can receive anything of the Lord. So you have to choose today which side you belong. Whether you belong to the world and its details and its glamour, or you belong to Christ who hold key to everything and has promised us that our constant and steady walk with him in faith and in fellowship will bring us everything. Remember the word of God says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto it. It is not all things that we are promised, but we are promised that when we begin to be obedient and serve God in his fullness, there's nothing that we can lack on this earth. And I believe God, and I believe God, and I uphold this statement, that this statement are true and they can never lie. One day the apostle Peter faced a very crucial test in his life. Remember when Jesus was going to go to the cross to, crucify, to be crucified? Jesus told the apostle Peter, he said, you will be offended in me. Three times you will deny that you never know me. And true to the word, even though Peter rejected Christ's session, but God is eternal. Christ knows everything before they, 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 they exist. He sees everything before they happen. You see? So we may, we may have a secret. Men may not know it, but Christ knows it. We can have a lip service, but God knows that that service is only limited to your lip and it's not of the heart. People may celebrate you to be the best, but in your heart, there's a huge question. There's a huge doubt on you. Christ does not see on the outside, but he sees what is on the inside of us. So it is better for our inner man to glorify God than to pay lip service to God. Now look at it. In John chapter 21, verse 3, God, Peter told his disciples, he told the disciples, he said, Simon Peter said unto them, I go fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night, they caught nothing. What point do I want to raise here? I was trying to say that when you are a lead person in every society or organization, people seem to believe in you. And whatever you do, they copy it. Wherever you go, you have people following you. Especially when you are liked by them. It was obvious that Peter was one of the closest to Jesus. One of the, one of the inner circles to Christ Jesus. So when Peter denied Christ, what did he do? As a result of shame and guilt... You know what he did? He went fishing. He decided to go back to where he was prior to his calling. And seven of the disciples of Christ had to go with him. How did he win them over? Once the lead person become discouraged, all others will follow the same trend. But I pray in the name of Jesus that your faith will not fail you. That you will stand very strong in face of any adverse circumstances. You are the one that people are looking up to. And therefore, don't betray Christ and do not disappoint the people. I say it again. Do not betray Christ and do not 
disappoint the people. So when Christ rose up from the dead, he made something, he said something very spectacular, which denote that Peter was not part of the rest of the disciples who were waiting for Christ's resurrection. It wasn't part of them. So the envoy who sent a message to the disciples about Christ's resurrection was told by Jesus that when you have told the disciples, go and tell Peter also. Which means that Peter's faith was completely downhill and need to be encouraged out. This evening, I want to take the opportunity to encourage you. No matter how far you have drifted, no matter how far you have gone, no matter the struggles in your heart, no matter the doubt that you are holding on to, you have become double-minded as to whether you want to continue or not. I want to let you know. I want to let you know that we have inherited much more glorious ministry, much more glorious promise, a victorious life, We've been given eternal life. We've been given anything that pertains to life and godliness. And therefore, this is not the time. This is not the time. This is not the time to lax in any form or whatever. So, the Bible said Christ appeared to the disciples when he rose up. He appeared to them, I think about three times the Bible said, he appeared to them, or for the sake of accuracy, let me put it this way, Christ appeared to disciples many times. Now, in the final of his appearance, the Bible said in John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17, and I want us to read it so that we look at something from that, from that point. Let's read from verse 6. He says, And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of the fishes. You know what it was? When they went fishing, when they rejected Christ, and gave up on the ministry, the Bible said they took up to their profession. As a result of that, they went all day. Remember, Peter's profession was fishing. He went all day, all night, and caught nothing. It was the final revelation of Christ into the life of Peter that would turn his life round and give him another leap of faith. In his commitment for the kingdom service, they never caught anything. There is no way you can turn your back on God and win any way in the world. There is no way you can drift off from Christ and ever thought that it will be better for you. I want to encourage you. It's in Christ that you can make it. It's in Christ that you can enjoy the blessing that is flowing from the throne of grace. It's in Christ that you can enjoy the blessings with health, in peace, and in harmony. I want to bless you tonight. So they casted the net all day, all night, and they caught nothing. And Christ appeared. From very far away, he, he spoke to them. He said, hey. Hey, you on the fishing expedition, have you caught anything? And they said, they've caught nothing. By that time, they have never recognized that it was Jesus who is appearing himself, who is showing up himself again. And they said, no, their toils were futile. So he told them to cast in the net at a particular angle. They did cast in the net and they had a great catch of fish. So the scripture unfolded. In the scripture unfolded that they came ashore. And when they came ashore, Christ has already 
set up fire so that they can be able to warm up themselves and barbecue some of the fish that they brought. It provided bread for them, for they are eating. Now, so when the process went on, which I want to read some other scriptures to back what I'm saying, verse 7 says, Therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he got his fisher's coat unto him, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coal there, and fish laid upon, and bread. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Now Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. So now there is something. So when they were having this fellowship with Christ and they have to bake some of the, the fish, or do I use the word bake, or they have to barbecue some of the fish and eat. In the process, Jesus turned to Peter. And this is the drama that unfolded. In verse 15 from verse 15, says, So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than this? You know what he was referring to? Do you love me more than turning your back on me? Do you love me more than betraying me? Do you love me more than letting the whole world know that you have quit from me? That is not a bad step to do. So he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Then feed my sheep. The drama that we are trying to, to look at over here, it means that the enemy has made an inroad in the life of Peter, the enemy has succeeded in defeating the eternal goal that Christ has for Peter and for the rest of the disciples. The enemy is intending that by you serving as a weak link all many people will suffer because the chain, the chain of command, the chain of fruitfulness, the chain of success will be truncated because you are the weakest link. Please, I am trying to let you know that do not be the weakest link in the family. Do not be the weakest link in the church. Do not be the weakest link among your friends. Stand by your conviction. Hold fast to your claim. Knowing very well that we have a higher calling. We have a ministry. We have a blessed hope. We have an eternal future. We have what the world can't take from us. We have 
what the world will envy one day. Hold claim to what you have. At that moment, Peter had to be restored. May this message also restore you. Weighing, weighing what the world is offering to an eternal weight of glory. We are not the one who will surrender. We are the one who will hold strong to our testimony. May the Lord richly bless you. The next point I want us to talk about here also is that realize the power of Christ when we are weak. When we are weak. The struggle is unto everyone. Sometimes we are up, sometimes we are down. Sometimes we are prayerless, sometimes we are prayerful. Sometimes in the power of our mind we want to accomplish, but it's not possible. When we are weak, let us quickly recognize the power of our strength in Christ Jesus. And this is a point that I want to raise to quickly stir you up to the remedies that we have in Christ. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4, it says again, and I quote, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Though our outward man is perishing, yet our inner man is renewed day by day. The outward man is what is going through the struggles. It what is exposed to the tortures. Is what is exposed to the persecutions. The outward man go through pain. But the Bible said joy will come as hope, as a manifestation of the hope that God has promised us. Weeping may deal for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Your outward man is going through something, but your inner man is renewed day by day. I said the other day on Thursday, I said the world does not know how we process our pain. They don't have the staying faith and the capacity to stand. When things are going bad. But there is grace placed inside of us which is much strong. Which can cope. So resilient. So powerful. And in the face of all things that is breaking people down. We are up and doing. We are up and going. Our testimony is much louder and stronger. I pray in Jesus mighty name. That you who is weak, identify your strength in Christ. Because what you need is not the strength of the outer man. You need the strength of the inner man. And he that is in you is much greater than he that is in the world. Let's say amen. Now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. So when we look at verse 8 and 9, what he said over there. Verse 8 and 9. We are troubled on every side, yet we are not distressed. We are perplexed, but not despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down. <coughs> but not destroy, always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. What is the Bible saying about? The consciousness of the fact that Christ is our pattern and he's gone through all the pain that we are going through today there is a possibility that having conquered all the pain, having conquered the suffering, we also have conquered already. We also have victory over it already. 
In Jesus' mighty name. Can I hear amen? Now, Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says that, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You want to hear it again? For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So there is a glory to be revealed in us. All the suffering and the pain that just be temporary. The afflictions are temporary. The struggles are temporary. The frustrations are temporary. But when we are able to hold our ground, God will say, well done, faithful servant, because you are able to maintain a testimony for me, I put you charge over these. You shall reign over that. And great is the reward that awaits all those people who have stood their ground and won the victory. In the name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Verse 29 of Romans 8 says that, For whom he foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Have you heard that? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 31 says that, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him out for us all. Now shall he not with us also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also reason. Oh, hallelujah. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, none of these things. For why? Because Christ has made us conquerors, much more conquerors much more victorious, much more successful over this in the name of Jesus. I'm sure you are enjoying this message. Hallelujah. You are enjoying this message. Now, in my conclusion, as I bring the message to a conclusion, now, let me let you know, there's a pattern we are following. Apostle Paul says that, let us be followers of him as he followed Christ. He's following Christ and identifying with Christ in his suffering, in his resurrection, and in his glory. While we follow Paul as a good example, we will also benefit the same glory that awaits the saints. I repeat again, we will benefit the same glory that awaits the saints. That is why he said, that he went through a lot of things. He went through a lot of things. He went through many beatings. He went through many shipwrecks. He went through many hungers. He may, went through bad weathers. As some cases, he became what? He was sleeping rough. He has no place to sleep. He was, he, 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 he was being manhandled. And all sort of things happened to this man. This man in whom is the glory of God. In whom Christ has revealed himself. He say that, I don't know whether I went into his glory or in his presence in a physical body or through translation. So here we are, this man, I've seen Christ face to face. I've been in the presence of Christ, but he has to go through the same thing. Why he did not compromise and give up? Because he weighed the eternal glory. He weighed the honor. He weighed what Benefit awaits him as compared to a tempera, tempera, tempera affliction, 
temporal persecution, temporal challenges, which the devil is bringing your way to subtract your faith, to, to make you compromise, you know, to distort your, your focus. Let us not surrender to the enemy in any way whatsoever in the name of Jesus. Let's put our hand to the Lord. Now, which I am going to conclude on this very scripture now, verse 16 to 18 of 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 to 18. It says that for which cause we fail not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. How did he describe it? He described all the tortures. He described all the pain as well, as light affliction. It will take a man that is strong in the Lord to discount, to discount, to discount all the threat that is coming against you. Threat that is coming against the church. Yes, threat that is coming against the believer. He called it a light affliction. And this is the step I want to follow. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now, verse 18, he says that, While we look not on the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, they are what? Eternal. The promise of God can only be assessed through the eye of faith. And the Bible said they never end. They are eternal. Praise the Lord, somebody. They are eternal. Praise the Lord, somebody. They are eternal. We have a present success in Christ Jesus. We have a present success in Christ Jesus. But at the same time, we have also a present affliction. A present success and we have a present affli affliction in Christ Jesus. And sometimes when we are successful, success can make us overlook a lot of things and relax our guard against the enemy. Let us be very careful. And at the same time, we have got an affliction. And this affliction, the Bible said, let us stand our guard and do not allow this affliction to win over our soul in Jesus' mighty name. So, brethren, I want you to understand that we have we have that which is eternal, which is always telling us, hang on in there, stand strong, don't relent, don't give up. We have also that which is in the world that says, oh, just quit, just quit, quit your faith, deny Christ, and if you do, I will give you everything. Now, everything is not a promise. Everything is a bait. Everything is just a bait to eventually destroy you. But when we have succeeded in walking with Christ, succeeded in walking with Christ and fulfilling all his agendas and his assignment in our life, beloved, there is nothing that we cannot have. I have come to let you know tonight, in the name of Jesus, that the good things are awaiting us. Health is awaiting us. Strength is awaiting us. Our safety in Christ is awaiting us. Our protection in Christ is awaiting us. Do not have the enemy to show us just a carbon copy. Let him not show us a carbon copy and let us shift to the side of the enemy. We have victory. And I pray in the name of Jesus that if you and I will come to this place of realization and hold strong because of all these that we have seen in Christ, all the promises that we have seen in Christ, all that future that we have been promised, in Christ, we will never, we will never faint. We will never be discouraged. So do not be discouraged. If you are the one that is hearing me and you are discouraged and you've drifted very far away, 
I can assure you that Peter did it. God reached out to him. Christ is also reaching out to you tonight. That you will fall back on his shoulders and he will restore you. So we have brought this, this message to a close. And I know that many of you are greatly blessed and well edified. All your struggles and your fears are taken care of by Christ. And is ready to reach out to your heart. Is ready to win you over. Just as he did to Peter and the rest of the disciples. Right now, wherever we are, we want to surrender back to him. <clears throat> and I want to help us to pray. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you, Lord, for reaching out to our heart and demonstrating your love again. You are an encourager. You are a builder. You are patient, oh God, over all our struggles and doubts and murmurings, oh God. Oh, Father, I brought you, oh God, this far to reach out to us again and win us over. I thank you, for, Father, for the many hearts that you have won over. And I thank you, God, for the many lives that you are repaired. I thank you, God, the many that you have strengthened. And I thank you, the many that have promised tonight to finish their journey with you. Bless them abundantly in the name of Jesus. If there is anyone, oh God, Father, that have a special need, I pray in the name of Jesus. That you will help them at the point of their need. Healed every, every infirmity in their body. Healed every disease in their body. Turn, O oh God, their captivities around. Let them live, O oh God, Father, the life of total victory. In Jesus' mighty name. And I pray that as the world hear my prayer, I bring conviction to their heart. And I bring salvation into their lives. I give thanks to you for hearing my prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. God richly bless you and thank you for your patience in hearing us again. And I know that God has enriched your heart so much. We will be expecting you again in our next broadcast on Sunday, 10 o'clock on the dot. God bless you.